Chapter Twenty Three of Great Disasters and Horrors in the World's History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. Great Disasters and Horrors in the World's History by Alan H. Godby. Chapter Twenty Three. But the center of this great volcanic region lies in the island of Java, which possesses about fifty craters, half of them still active. The heat and vapors poured out, combined with the power of the sun, combined to make this one of the most noted tempest regions in the world. Nowhere else are such terrific thunderstorms so common and more than twenty waterspouts are sometimes seen at one time. One of the most remarkable eruptions of modern times is that of Papandayang, in this island, which occurred in 1772. The mountain burst forth suddenly, with a tremendous roaring. Cinders and ashes were almost insignificant. Immense boulders were hurled about the neighboring regions. The mountain was veiled in a cloud of glowing vapor, a tract of land seventeen miles long and seven miles wide, with over forty villages, was swallowed up. Several thousand people perished. When the cloud finally vanished, it was found that four thousand feet of the upper portion of the mountain had been blown away. The broad, ragged mass remaining was of little more than one-half the original height. Two other mountains in the island were in action at the same time, while several intervening active cones remained quiet. Mount Guntor, in the same island, has had a number of violent eruptions. The last, occurring in 1800, sent forth, in addition to lava streams, a torrent of white, acid, sulfurous mud, which swept a populous and fertile valley, engulfing hundreds of men and animals in its course. We shall notice by and by a still more remarkable Javanese convulsion. Time would fail were details to be given of the numerous volcanoes of Sumatra and Celebes and the adjacent islands, or of the eruptions in boiling springs of New Zealand, or the towering cones of New Guinea, or the peaks of the Canary, Cape Verde, and Azores. Let us notice briefly a few of the more noted volcanoes of America. Our own land is free, for the most part, from such disturbances, the only recorded outbreaks being those of Rainier and St. Helens in 1842. But in prehistoric times it had numerous volcanic areas. The Rattan Peaks in New Mexico once sent out lava streams that spread over the country between the upper Arkansas and Canadian rivers, and St. Helens, Hood, Edgecombe, Baker, Rainier, Fairweather, and Shasta are cones well known to the western tourist. These, except Hood and Shasta, are still active. But better known examples of great internal heat are found in the hot springs of different portions of the country, though these merely show the existence of subterranean heat and afford no conception of its power or violence. Quite as famous is the famous geyser basin of the Yellowstone. Here is a region surpassing greatly the geyser district of Iceland both in area and in the number and power of the geysers. The whole region is pierced with fumaroles, around which sulfur and other minerals crystallize in beautiful forms, and steam jets break through the soil in countless places. Certain of the geysers are exceedingly periodic, and others, like the stroker of Iceland, may be incited to action at almost any time by casting in earth or stones. The more powerful of these toy volcanoes send water to a height of 400 feet. In the southern portion of the continent and in South America we find a region of remarkable activity. Central America has had several violent convulsions at a comparatively recent period. The volcano of Las Virgenes in Lower California had a great eruption in 1746 but the country being sparsely peopled, little harm was done, and the fact of the eruption was made known by the light and clouds seen from vessels at sea, and the ashes and cinders that fell in the adjacent regions of Mexico. 
if eruptions be measured by the violence of explosions then the famous outburst of kosakina must rank among the greatest if not itself the greatest that is known to history the narrative of its eruption as related by an eyewitness seems almost beyond belief but the facts are too well authenticated the extent of the destruction of life though certainly reaching many hundreds was never definitely known the personal narration serves to show the fearful impressions made upon those who experienced such awful convulsions the wonder to me is how any man could live through such a burst as Cosaquinas in san salvador twas the twenty first of january eighteen thirty five as fine a morning as ever was seen on earth the bay of fonseca was smooth as silk never a cloud in the sky the lazy folks of playa grande and nagascolo were lying in the hammocks beside the doors smoking and dozing and not a soul had a notion of ill from any side on that sunny morning which was to be the last for half of them they lay in hammocks and smoked and dozed like worthless cusses as they are and most of them no doubt had full in sight the big mountain on the other side of the gulf they'd nigh forgot to call it a volcano not for a thousand years as the indians told had smoke or mischief come from that hill they'd a laughed silly any one who had talked danger from kosakina at ten o'clock that morning that mountain burst out again and in a fury such as never yet was known in the upper world no nor ever will be again as i believe till the last day suddenly it burst out not muttering beforehand nor smoking but crash all on the moment as if to remind men what evil power was yet left in nature to destroy them at ten o'clock that day the voice of the mountain was heard after one thousand years silence in such a thunderous roar was it heard that beast and bird fell dead with the sound alone and great cliffs pitched headlong into the sea there's thousands still alive to witness for a while the streets of playa grande and nagascolo must have seemed like streets of the dead for every soul was stunned folks were lying in their hammocks or on the floor motionless and senseless as corpses the sky was still bright and blue but on the mountain side was a cloud like ink which rolled down like a cap to the foot not afterwards seemed so horrible as the sudden heaping of that jet-black mound in the place of the sunny green hill but it didn't long offend any man's sight over heaven and sea the cloud opened and spread lightning and thunders burst from the heart of the ocean and sheets of flame glared luridly the sides of Cosaquina. The darkness spread so quick that at Lyon, two hundred miles away, they were lighting the church candles within an hour after the outbreak. But candles, nor torches, nor houses of flame, couldn't disperse that darkness. For three days no soul in Lyon saw another's face, nor ventured out but to the howling churches, to grovel there, night dragged after night but no day shone over the land a lighted torch could not be seen at arm's length the ashes fell softly and silently till buildings crushed down headlong with the weight tigers were in the churches and panthers entered house doors in search of companionship and protection hundreds committed suicide in their madness and hundreds more became simple for life Men's faces were blistered by the hot winds, the paint fell from the statues, the crash of falling, and the faint light of burning houses doubled the horror of darkness. Such a time as that was never seen on earth since the plague of Egypt, I guess. But of course the most awful work was around the Gulf of Fonseca. The water rose in waves twenty feet high, dashed over the Estero, and swept off the towns of Playa Grande and Nagascolo slick as a prairie fire scarce a soul escaped for twenty miles about the cattle crushed over the barrancas in search of water and were destroyed in herds of thousands at a time for none could see nor hear nor breathe rivers were dried by the heat and choked with ashes forests burned up 
the very grass withered throughout the whole length and breadth of the nicaragua and hasn't sprung since Sacate, meaning a broad flag-like blade alone escaped and the country which was once the grazing land of central america was ruined till eternity for that business during this time of death as they still call it at belize one thousand miles away the commandant called out the garrison and kept them under arms twenty-four hours thinking all the navies in the universe were at action in the offing there twas too dark to see fifty yards oceanwards the roar of cosequina was heard miles around spreading fear and perplexity four thousand miles in radius their ashes fell they lay on the roofs at san francisco california well the mountains behave like a decent sort of power cask ever since the fuse has always been burning and spitting but you see there's a big consumption of power in such a burst and i guess the old machine wants to recuperate a while those familiar with the terrific effects produced on the gunners by the discharge of heavy artillery can understand that the atmospheric concussion produced by tremendous volcanic explosions might kill large numbers of birds and small animals in the vicinity as to the distance to which ashes may be carried a late eruption in iceland was announced by a professor in germany long before any vessel brought the news the atmosphere was unusually full of dust which on examining with the microscope he pronounced to be pulverized iceland lava the detonations in cosequina were heard over the peninsula of yucatan along the shores of jamaica eight hundred miles distant and as far as bogota in south america nearly ten thousand feet above the sea ashes fell on vessels twelve hundred miles westward at sea fortunately the eruption was soon over another unusual outbreak occurred in central america from the volcano of leon in eighteen sixty seven beginning november twenty seven first there were a number of violent explosions which shook the earth for a great distance immense quantities of black sand were then thrown out and a column of vapor and fire filled with meteor-like specks was hurled to the height of three thousand feet closer observation showed the specks to be rocks four or five feet in diameter and weighing thousands of pounds the showers of sand lasted three days covering the earth for fifty miles around the forest for leagues was scarred by the swift falling showers of sand and stones and for half a mile around the cone the trees were leveled to the ground central america contains twenty-nine volcanoes eighteen of which are active twenty cones are in sight from the town of leon one cone Izalco, suddenly manifested signs of activity but no eruption took place but the sudden heating rapidly melted the snow on the mountain and the torrents of water inundated the town of guatemala destroying thousands of dollars worth of property besides many lives the mountain has since been known as agua or water south america is noted for the frequency and extreme violence of its earthquakes of which more hereafter though possessing a greater number of very lofty volcanic cones than any other region the direct effect of its eruptions has not been so disastrous as the results of many eruptions elsewhere there is but one very notable exception the earthquake that destroyed rio bamba in seventeen ninety four was followed at once by an outpour of mud from tunconcaragua which overwhelmed forty thousand people still dazed by the shock or struggling in the ruins of their villages one notable incident is the continual subterranean roaring heard for a considerable period over twenty three hundred square miles of northern venezuela a number of years ago during a violent outpour of lava from the volcano of st vincent an island six hundred and twenty three miles to the northeast no motion of the earth was perceptible it has been supposed that the noise was merely the roar of st vincent conveyed to the crust of the earth but this would raise the question as to why the same noise was not audible at points nearer to st vincent another suggestion is the source from which the lava of st vincent was derived lay beneath northern venezuela and a fact brought in support of this is that the great earthquake of caracas was immediately followed by action at st vincent 
similarly the great eruption of cotopaxi in seventeen forty four was attended by subterranean rumbling at honda four hundred and thirty six miles away and eighteen thousand and one hundred feet lower between are the colossal mountains of pasto pinchincha and popoyan with countless valleys and ravines the cone of cotopaxi is the smoothest and most symmetrical in the world perhaps because its eruptions are almost entirely of ashes or fragmentary lava as no villages lie in its immediate neighborhood the clouds of ashes have not done so much damage as might be expected the first sign of an eruption is the melting of the snow upon the cone torrents of water sweep down the mountain such an outbreak occurring in seventeen forty one after two centuries repose the amount of snow accumulated may be imagined the rush of the water tore away blocks of lava ice and scoria the plain below was covered with dashing waves twelve miles from the mountains the water still had a velocity of fifty-six feet per second or about two-thirds of a mile a minute escape from such a current would be impossible six hundred houses were swept away and one thousand people destroyed the sides of the cone glowed in the night with the reddish light cotopaxi also had a great eruption in fifteen thirty three which hurled lava blocks containing one hundred and thirty cubic yards to a distance of nine miles such masses would weigh more than two hundred and eighty tons such feats will serve to give clearer ideas of the immense power of volcanic action perhaps a statement of the force required to raise a column of lava would interest the reader lava being about twenty-eight times as heavy as water a column of it eleven and three-sevenths feet high and one inch square would weigh fifteen pounds when we remember that our powerful steam engines are operated by pressures varying from one hundred and twenty to two hundred pounds per square inch it is evident we can have no adequate conception of the magnitude of a force of twenty seven thousand pounds to the square inch and yet such a power must be but a tithe of the force exerted for it represents only the force necessary to throw the lava from the surface to the tops of the mountains whereas the lava reservoirs are far beneath the surface also the above calculation considers only the mere weight of the lava it allows nothing for the resistance of cohesion friction or a heavy crust to be often burst through when we consider all these each of which must far surpass the weight of the single column of lava it is evident that the pressure that can hurl lava blocks of two hundred and eighty tons nine miles from a mountain must reach a million pounds per square inch these are meaningless figures human thought cannot grasp so stupendous a power perhaps the best known of the great volcanoes are those of the sandwich islands we find there the largest extinct crater in the world the great dead crater of haleakala in east maui is thirty miles in circumference the crater of kilauea on the flank of mauna loa is about seven miles in circumference several great eruptions have occurred in these islands during the past fifty years and in one of these convulsions the volume of lava poured out was at least equal to the great outburst of skaptarjokul in iceland and when we consider the frequent recurrence of the hawaiian eruptions it at once appears that in this region lies the greatest lava producer on the globe but in regard to destruction of life or property there has so far been no more harmless region in the world there are two reasons the lava poured out is very liquid and cools slowly hence a cone formed from it has a very gradual slope the actual grade of mauna loa is but five or six degrees so a lava stream descends it very slowly and the light on the mountain warns the people of the outbreak the shore region is the only one inhabited the interior being covered with dense forests so the lava may burn a path directly through to the sea and yet do no great damage to the interests of the people the greatest damage done to the island has not been from an outpour of lava but from earthquakes and sea waves the great eruption of eighteen sixty eight was accompanied by continual shocks two thousand being felt in a fortnight and numerous tidal waves were produced yet the total fatality was but one hundred 
and nearly all of these were old or weak persons who were unable to swim well enough to escape from waves that overtook them a few were overwhelmed by a torrent of soft red clay that broke from a fissure in the mountain cliffs and crags were thrown down by the earthquakes and the top of one hill was thrown one thousand feet the lava stream reached the sea at nanawali fifty miles from its source and pushed three-fourths of a mile into the sea again in an eruption in eighteen eighty two lava streams poured out toward the town of hilo and though the great crater continued in full blast it was nine months before the people could be sure whether the streams would destroy the town or not at length the lava was within five minutes walk of the town many collected their chattels and left then the action on the mountain suddenly subsided and in a few days the great red dragon lay stiff and cold almost at the people's doors since the natives build their houses almost invariably on one story and of the lightest materials earthquakes can do comparatively little damage to most property hence with all the activity of the great volcanoes the inhabitants are far more secure than those of many other regions apparently not so dangerous persons may readily visit the great crater in eruption though at full blast and excursion parties are organized to visit this niagara of fire on every occasion of unwanted activity nowhere else in the world can volcanic action on the grandest scale be so carefully observed the details given hitherto will serve to illustrate the terrible havoc wrought by subterranean forces so far only outpouring of volcanic matter has been especially noticed but here examining the terribly destructive force of earthquakes alone it is meet that the story of the tremendous eruptions of the century be closed with the story of the greatest of the age and indeed when all details are considered it may rank as the most tremendous convulsion of all history in certain details skaptar may have exceeded it in destruction of life etna surpassed it in sixteen sixty nine but as a whole it is simply without parallel the reader will rightly judge that such a convulsion could hardly occur elsewhere than in the malayan archipelago already the terrible outburst in sambawa has been noted also several others in java java and sumatra formerly formed a single island but were separated by a terrific earthquake in eleven fifteen shocks are felt in one of the two islands nearly every month the list of calamities occurring there during the past hundred years is appalling besides the convulsions before noted an eruption of galongong in eighteen twenty two overwhelmed one hundred and fourteen villages and destroyed four thousand people in eighteen forty three mount guntor cast forth thirty million tons of ashes doing immense injury to life and property in eighteen sixty seven there was a tremendous earthquake which killed many thousands in the interior of the island and dried up or greatly obstructed the water courses immediately afterward the volcano of ganan salak ejected such a quantity of cinders and lava that the work of obliterating or obstructing the streams was complete the cesspools and marshes bred pestilence and epidemics which have carried off from batavia alone nearly a million of inhabitants in the past twenty-two years in eighteen seventy two the volcano of marapi burst out and destroyed several thousand people in the province of kadu sixteen severe earthquakes were felt in eighteen seventy eight and another one in eighteen seventy nine at length in eighteen eighty three krakatoa a volcano on a small island in the straits of sunda in the very centre of the greatest subterranean furnace on the globe began to manifest some uneasiness as in the case of kosakina people had almost forgotten to call it a volcano and when the mountain muttered and fired a little in february they regarded it with some curiosity and then when it quieted down thought no more about it on the twenty fifth of august the people of batavia heard peculiar subterranean mutterings as they thought but the roar increased till it might have been compared to a battery of fortress artillery an avalanche of stones and ashes began to fall and continued all night 
Krakatoa had begun. By morning it was impossible for Batavians to reach the Straits of Sunda. The bridges were down and the roads impassable. The waters of the Straits were in fearful turmoil. Explosions beneath the sea followed each other in rapid succession. The waters were sixty degrees hotter than usually. The rebounding waves were dashing upon Madura, five hundred miles away, mountains high. The dance of death had hardly begun. Louder and louder roared Krakatoa. Ere noon, Mahameru, the greatest of Japanese volcanoes, had joined in. Then Ganonguntor opened. Others rapidly followed, till fifteen volcanoes of Java were in eruption, most of them in full blast. The awful scene was beyond description. Krakatoa could still be heard thundering above all the rest. Before nightfall, Ganonguntor, the greatest active crater in the world, four miles in diameter, was spouting enormous streams of lava and sulfurous mud. Tremendous explosions followed with showers of cinders and stones, as though the old giant were endeavoring to outdo the leader of the dance. Terrible was the slaughter by the flying fragments. The sea was more violently agitated. Dense clouds of hot, sulfurous vapors, charged with electricity, hung over the waters, and added whirlwinds and thunderstorms to the scene. Fifteen large water spouts could be seen at one time. On the shore, men, women, and children ran wildly about. There was no safety upon sea or land. Houses were crumbling, the atmosphere darkening, the storm increasing. Hundreds of people were buried beneath ruined houses. Hundreds more were struck down in their flight. Immense crevices opened and swallowed. Huge waves rushed inland and devoured. It seemed as though Java were to buried with a rain of fire in the unfathomable depths of the sea. Towards midnight it seemed as though the Prince of Darkness might be present in person to direct the work of destruction. A luminous cloud far more colossal than that which had appeared above Ganangantur gathered above the chain of the Kandangs, which run along the southeast coast of Java. This cloud increased in size each minute until at last it came to form a sort of a gray and blood-red color, which hung over the earth for a considerable distance. In proportion as this cloud grew, the eruption gained fresh force, and the floods of lava poured down the mountain sides without ceasing and spread into the valleys, where they swept all before them. On Monday morning about two o'clock the heavy clouds suddenly broke up and finally disappeared. When the sun rose it was found that a tract of country extending from Port Capucine to the south as far as Nigeri Pasarang to the north and west, and covering an area of about fifty square miles, had entirely disappeared. There stood the previous day the villages of Nigeri and Nigeri Babawang. Not one of the inhabitants had escaped. They and their villages had been swallowed up by the sea. The population was not so dense in this part of the island as in others, but for all this the total number of victims fell little short of fifteen thousand. The chain of the Kandangs, which runs along the coast of Java in a semicircle for sixty-five miles, had also disappeared. The waters of Welcome Bay in the Strait of Sunda, those of Pepper Bay to the east, and those of the Indian Ocean to the south, had burst in upon the country, where they formed a raging torrent. All the furies of the deeps of earth and sea seemed freed to work their will and wreak their wrath. The great Papandayang now joined in the chaos. The cannon-like reports could be heard fifty miles away. Then Sumatra was infected with the wild fury. From one of her volcanoes three columns of lava shot up from three different places, and three leaping red streams of lava dashed forth for the plains below. The mountain hurled after them showers of stones. Volumes of black dust flew after, making thick, stifling darkness which could be felt. Banks of ashes lay upon the roofs of houses, or muffled the city streets. A tornado hurried by, bearing stones, dust, roofs, trees, houses, and men. In Java the fierce Papandayang burst open. 
from the seven great fissures the lava in its basin plunged out and reached for miles from the mountain's base on the site of the island of merak which was swallowed up by the sea the next day fourteen volcanic mountains sprang up forming a chain from st nicholas point java to hoga point in sumatra in batavia and Anjir were three thousand five hundred european residents eight hundred of these never saw the light again an overwhelming avalanche of rock mud and lava poured upon their quarter in Anjir. then the sea leaped upon those struggling in the ruins and swept away all not so much as a trace of them was left two thousand inhabitants perished besides a large number of fugitives from other quarters bantam was submerged and one thousand five hundred people drowned waves dashed completely over the island of sarong and not a single inhabitant escaped the storms of rock and lava numbered their victims at cherubon and at several noted pleasure resorts the great temple of borobudur was ruined its dome being beaten in by the showers of rock this is a most deplorable architectural loss it was the largest buddhist temple in the east and had no equal in the world erected eleven hundred years ago it stood on an eminence in a circular valley it had a great central dome one hundred and forty five feet high surrounded by seventy smaller domes on the platforms beneath were four hundred and fifty chapels cut in openwork out of granite and each having a statue of buddha the walls of the temple contained a complete picture history of buddha there being four thousand beautifully chased bias reliefs not a stone was left uncarved the great chapel under the central dome was reached by a series of four grand staircases of five hundred feet each no other structure is comparable to it a few may be even more splendid but it was decidedly sui generis the list of calamities grew rapidly the town of tamarang was devoured by the lava red-hot stones fired many houses eighteen hundred people perished the island of onius was terribly shaken and then plunged into the sea the island of mida was swallowed up no one escaped the lighthouses on sunda strait were wrecked the town of chirigan was destroyed with ten thousand people nine hundred people perished at waronga three hundred corpses were dug from the ruins of talatoa the river jacatana was blocked with lava and ashes and leaving its bed poured through batavia the island of Morocco, a fortified place three miles from krakatoa was a valuable government stone quarry six or seven years in use thousands of native workmen were assembled there with engineers and overseers their huts were on hills one hundred and fifty feet above the sea the end of the season was at hand the first of september would see them returning to their java homes the island trembled paused sank slowly the sea plunged over it two natives and a european bookkeeper escaped a steamer put out from the port of talak batong two inches of lava lay upon her deck pumice stone lay ten feet deep on the sea around her but when a short distance out we saw a gigantic wave of prodigious height suddenly advancing upon us at great speed from the direction of the open sea immediately the captain brought his vessel round so as to meet the wave stern foremost after a moment of most piquant anxiety we found ourselves lifted up with terrific speed our vessel bounded upward and then we felt ourselves plunged into the abyss but the wave had passed us and we were out of all danger like a high mountain the gigantic wave sped furiously towards the shore while immediately after three other great waves followed it the waters rushed in and destroyed the town sweeping away first the lighthouse which fell in like a pack of cards then all the buildings beyond in a few moments all was over and where once talak Patong stood there was nothing but water livid with terror the captain steamed rapidly to warn the town of anger there was no longer an anger a dutch fort a garrison a single sailor who had caught a floating tree stalked about among the corpses krakatoa which had opened this fearful carnival of death 
sank slowly into the sea of the island twenty-five miles long and seventeen wide a small portion of the terribly shattered cone remained in sight new islets were made vast shoals created sailors discovered new islands and landed only to find themselves on vast floating pumice rafts miles from land new charts had to be made for a time the seas were hardly navigable such is the story the damage to property was millions of dollars the loss of life will never be definitely known first estimates placed it at eighty thousand conservative judges pronounced it in all probability between fifty thousand and sixty thousand the explosions were heard as far away southward as australia to the westward as far as southern india to the eastward they are said to have been heard in the caribbean sea even if we reject the latter we may take the others and obtain some idea by imagining volcanoes at st louis to be heard at new york and san francisco at mexico and in hudson's bay the great sea wave rushed from krakatoa to the mauritius in eight hours it rolled around the coast of the australian continent dashing into the southern harbors sweeping through the narrow bass straits it rose and fell upon hawaiian coasts in a perplexing manner it surged against south america against east africa it rounded cape horn and made itself known on the coasts of france upon our atlantic shore it encircled the world the greatest sea wave ever known the volcanic microscopic dust remained long in the air and occasioned the singular redness of the sky at morn and eve that prevailed throughout the world for the next two years apart from the suspended dust the volcano threw out as much matter as the mississippi bears to the gulf in two hundred and fifty years the atmospheric wave of low barometer was even more marked than the oceanic wave on the day when krakatoa sank into the sea the barometric oscillation was noticed all over the world from the time at which it reached berlin it is found to have traveled eight hundred and seventy five miles an hour thirty-six hours later the barometric oscillations were repeated but less pronounced thirty-seven hours afterward there came a third and still fainter series it appears then that the atmospheric wave set in motion by this stupendous outbreak was powerful enough to thrice encircle the world it has been but a short time since geologists believed the magnitude of the subterranean forces to be greatly decreased but in view of a century of great eruptions closed by such an appalling convulsion it must be said that the fiery forces are at least as active and powerful as ever end of chapter twenty three recording by warren cotty gurney illinois